Well, hello, friends. I'm Pete Burak, and I'm here with Dr. Ralph Martin, and we're in the studios here at Renewal Ministries, offering you, hopefully, uh, a slightly new thing for us, which is a, a kind of a long-form conversation that we're going to have with Ralph. And I've, for this episode at least, I've arranged some questions that I'm looking forward to asking him. But for future episodes, we're hoping that you can get in the game a little bit in the comments, or you can send us an email with any questions that you have for Ralph, and that periodically we're going to do these things in order to just have a conversation, but also hopefully bring clarity in charity around some topics that are near and dear to our hearts and what we perceive the Spirit is doing in the church and where we feel like clarity is needed. So, Ralph, you ready to go? Ready or not. Ready or not. <laughs> Here we go. We're filming. It's <laughs> yeah, happening. Right. Yeah, We're in the studios. The lights are on, right? Right, right. All right. Well, right. good. Well, we're going to start kind of more gently, I guess, and get into some topics in, in a minute that may be a little bit more of a doozy area. But I've... I've had people ask me this question, and I've asked you this question before, but I think everyone would be edified by, what What does your daily prayer time look like? Like, what does it look like for Ralph Martin, yeah. who's literally, literally written books on prayer? Yeah. How, how do you pray? What does it look like? Well, one of the things I've learned over the years is that it works best when it's literally the first thing I do in the morning. Hmm. And then if I think I have, a, like, a you know flexible day and I could, like, have breakfast first or check my email first sometimes my flexible day doesn't work out yeah right so i, I try as, as as much as i possibly can to do it first thing in the morning i i do in recent years i have been doing it with a cup of coffee uh, i'm hoping that this is a drug-induced contemplation <laughs> yeah that's right yeah that's right yeah <laughs> but it seems to help me be awake you know type of sure. thing and I'll, I'll just start by uh actually bowing down like the little children of fatima did the angel taught them how to pray by you know, putting their forehead on the ground and saying a prayer that, that the angel taught them how to pray. I believe in you, I adore you, I hope in you, and I love you, and I ask your pardon for those who don't believe in you and don't adore you and don't hope in you and don't love you, and you say it three times. And then I usually add an extra prayer for, for me. I say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And I'll kind of ask the Lord to help me in some areas I know need to be helped in. And then I'll uh, pray for some particular high priority intentions, you know. And then I'll get up and uh, sit in a chair. My wife bought me this really nice chair, like I don't know, maybe 30 or 40 years ago, and it's like it's good as new, and it's just it's just comfortable, but mm. it's not too comfortable. You're not too comfortable. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah it's yeah. just like you know, it's just you know, I don't have to shift around in it. It's just sort of like good. And I'll just kind of be quiet for a while and. Um, I have an icon of Jesus across the room, which I love. Uh, it's only been the last few years that this icon has really kind of got me, you mm -hmm. know. And uh, it's an icon of the face of Jesus, and it's from a maybe a fourth century icon of Jesus, the Pantocrator, you know, the the ruler, the judge coming in glory. But all you see is his face, you know. So you don't get the kind of coming to, you know, to com yeah. coming to yeah. town type yeah. of thing. Yeah. But it's just. The, pray, the face of Jesus, and uh, people say it kind of matches the Shroud of Turin. So, you know, I feel, I feel like, you know, it's close enough to how Jesus probably looked. And so I'll just look over there, and I'll feel like, um, I'll feel like the person that I'm praying to uh, is, is real, is there, is a person, you know. And so the icon really makes you feel like, wow, Jesus, you know. You're the one speaking to me in the scripture. You're saying this, you know, type of thing. Then I'll think of God the Father, too, you know. And then after a while, that will kind of, like, come to an end, and I'll pick up Magnificat. Did you want this detail, Pete? Yeah, absolutely. This is what I'm, exactly what I'm looking for. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So then I'll pick up Magnificat, this little monthly, I don't know what you call it, prayer book or whatever, where it has the daily scripture readings every day, and it has a little morning prayer, and it has a little intercession place, and I have a little list of things I'm praying for that are less high priority than the ones I do kneeling down on the floor. And uh, and then there's a saint of the day, and there's a meditation of the day. And uh, so uh, I'll go through that kind of quietly, but hardly a day goes by without some line of the psalm, the daily psalm from Mass, or one of the readings, or one of the prayers just kind of like say, you know, I just feel like, wow, you know, look what Jesus is saying, or look yeah. what God's revealing to us, or look at the prayer that somebody prayed before that's so relevant for, for right now type of thing. So I'll be doing that for a while, and then maybe 
that will kind of come to an end and then I'll just be quiet again, you know, type of thing. And um, so I, I try to pray an hour a day and most days I can do that. And But I, I always want to tell people, you know, don't be intimidated by that. You know, like, uh, you know, for, Francis de Sales says busy Catholic lay people shouldn't pray more than an hour a day. And usually when I share that in a talk, people kind of gasp or, you know. Mm-hmm. You know. So it's just so important, though, Pete, to pray every day. You know, take some time for personal prayer every day. So I would definitely recommend to anybody listening to us, uh, take some time. Take 10 or 15 minutes a day. Just do Magnificat. Uh, just, I don't know, just do something because... We're not going to kind of grow in the Lord unless we pay attention to Him, you know, type of thing, unless we right. pay attention to being with Him. And now one of the things that's pretty amazing is that, uh, you know, we talk about how important Eucharistic adoration is and, you know, the tabernacle in church. Well, the amazing thing is we are tabernacles. Mm-hmm. That's what God tells us, you know. You're temples of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So we are temples of the Holy Spirit. We are tabernacles. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are dwelling in us. So, whoa, you know, even if the churches get closed again, we got a tabernacle right, right in our house, you know, right wherever yeah. we are, type of thing, you know. So anyway, and then I'll maybe look at the icon of Jesus some more. And so, you know, that's it. Then I'll go down and have breakfast and you know, yeah, go about your day, day. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thing. yeah. But I'll try, I'll try to be aware of the the Lord all day long and not just restrict my relationship to Him, you know, during sure. the, t- the time of prayer, but try to pray before each thing I do and ask the Holy Spirit for help. You know, I I realize I need the Holy Spirit to help me in everything that I do, and so I I, I do that. Yeah, you know, So you know. I think what was interesting, I think many of us would have expected some of those elements, right? Mm-hmm. Scripture reading, maybe mm-hmm. time for silence, but the fact that you, that you found that meditating on an icon, sacred art, mm-hmm. does something. There's a there's something that's transferred through looking mm-hmm. at the face of Jesus. Yeah. Uh, can you speak to like your experience with whether it's music or a beautiful building or art? What kind of, well, how we should approach those things? Because throughout the history of the church, that's been something that's been largely celebrated and, and promoted through the church's history of mm-hmm. beautiful things telling the story of God. And yeah. then there's been different responses to that that have been more negative, right? Yeah. Um, and then now... You, Many would argue that a lot of our churches have not kind of continued that tradition of something about beauty transmitting the truth of God. Yeah. So how, how would you kind of talk about that in the sense of, like, what has your experience been? You've already kind of touched on it, yeah. but then how are we? How important is that in the life of a disciple? You know? Well, I think it can be very helpful. You know, I, I prefer more traditional churches, you know, uh, where... The lighting is fluorescent, and um, you know there's images, and you know there's beautiful, you know stations of the cross and tabernacle and all that. But I I, I also appreciate just a church period. Hmm. You know, like there's plenty of 50s and 60s churches around that we all go to, and I don't I don't diss them. You know, I realize that. You know, the Lord is there, and we can worship the Lord there. You know, so I prefer an older, medieval-looking church. Sure. But uh, I, I really know that it's a privilege just to have a church and to be in a church and that the Lord is there. And um, so, yeah. So, so is there a dis- the difference between personal preference and something that is actually kind of like transcendently good and true and beautiful that we should be all in agreement around? So, for instance, like music choice yeah some music tends to be at least in the secular world very much a personal preference thing Mm -hmm. like you could like country i don't like country you know like at all i've never liked a country song in my life right but i know plenty of other people who love country right Right. but when it comes to uh sacred worship or anything that draws us to god that's designed to help us praise him Mm -hmm. where does personal preference fit into that well, I think there's some objective criteria, but I don't think that only one style of music is suitable for worshiping the Lord. So I think it should be, the lyrics should be faithful to Scripture and reflect the appropriate attitude towards God and relationship with Him. Uh, I think the uh, rhythm and, and melody and all that 
uh, should be conducive to lifting the mind and heart to the Lord rather than to waltzing or dancing or mm-hmm. whatever mm-hmm. type of thing. Yeah. And so, um, but I think that that can that can happen through classic Gregorian or polyphonic, you know, music. It can happen through just 19th century German hymns, which is mostly what we we sing type of thing. But I think it also can happen in a very beautiful and significant way through contemporary Christian music. Although a lot of the contemporary Catholic music from right after Vatican II, I didn't feel like had the depth, you know, that that it needs to have. It was more, you know, happy, clappy, you know, kind of. I almost felt like when Anna and myself, my wife Anna and myself, go to a certain church and they're singing some of those songs. I feel like, can I have this dance, you know, type of yeah, thing. You know, it's yeah. just, it just isn't, doesn't lift your mind and heart to the Lord type of thing. But some of the contemporary Christian music, I think, is very profound and very helpful for lifting the mind and heart to the Lord. So I think that, but then the personal preferences come in. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I would just encourage people, just like, don't to this, don't miss the Lord in a 1960s era church and around don't miss the Lord in a style of music uh, that isn't your personal preference, but can really be a help. You know, so sure. expand your range because that's what we really see in the Scripture. Mm. We see we see such a range of, of ways of praising the Lord in the Scripture. You know, one of the Psalms says, "You know, be still and know that I am God." So you know, quiet worship before the Lord. Lots of Psalms say, "Make a joyful noise to the Lord." You know, praise the Lord with with cymbals and trumpets, and you know, so. And in, in the book of Revelations, we see silence falling over heaven for a half hour, and then the Lamb opens the scroll, and the, the everybody throws their crowns down, and there's you know uproarious kind of praise yeah. and worship. So, I just think we shouldn't we shouldn't limit ourselves to any dimension of the Holy Spirit's working, and for any dimension of how the Holy Spirit has informed and inspired styles of music and prayer. Yeah. Okay. Well, shifting gears here a little bit, um, one of the things that seems to mark our current age both in the church and outside the church, is a lot of um, deconstruction, mm-hmm. both of faith, but of, of commonly held principles, of even things like Christendom, mm-hmm. you know. And, but then also then uh, arising out of that deconstruction, if you will, uh, or maybe it de- could be called deconstruction or progressivism in a, in a slightly different light, rising out of that seems to be this um, abundance of camps, mm-hmm. yeah. of of different groupings of people who are rallying around certain certain aspects of either life or church teaching or personal preference mm-hmm. or liturgy or whatever mm-hmm. there's and some of that is is from a catholic standpoint a beautiful part of the church right well, one body many parts we mm-hmm. all there's different charisms that are, arise mm-hmm. but it seems to be ha, have accelerated into this kind of my people your people just a whole I don't know, a tribalism. Yeah. Maybe I could call it that. Yeah. That or has even emerged. like sectarian spirit or cultic spirit or whatever. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. So without getting necessarily into the, at this point, the, the different reasons or different camps that people might find themselves mm-hmm. in, when you just see this happening, what does that say to you? Because it doesn't seem like it would be of God to have a broken body of Christ. Right. And no. it's so, and all the division. So what, what does that speak to? And, Kind of, what's your read of that? Yeah. Well, I think, I, I think you know, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will see God or what you know. Um, I, I think we need to be careful not to react to uh, what we think are deformations or exaggerations or extremes, and try to understand what people are saying. Try to appreciate the truth that they're trying to point to, without falling into uh, condemning. Uh, people one way or the other. Uh, at the same time, I think it's a call to clarify again what's the foundations of our unity. Like, what's the source of our unity as a church? Mm-hmm. And the source of our unity as a church is God. Uh, it's uh, the sacraments. It's our doctrine. It's the deposit of faith. It's the sacred scriptures, the sacred tradition. And it's articulated today in an authoritative way in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. So, I say to the extent that these tribes or camps are departing in one way or another from the source of our unity, uh, there has to be correction. You know, mm-hmm. there has to be 
repentance. And it's easy to uh, not formally reject an aspect of the of the of the truth, but to kind of kind of close down into hostility towards others who don't see things quite the same way we see it as, as we do. So I, I think we have to return to the sources of our unity and together kind of point in the same direction towards what mm-hmm. God reveals to us and mm-hmm. how it's kind of brought forward to us in the church. So then how do you kind of maintain a balance between what you just described and then what somebody might interpret, like you just had a recent video come out on our YouTube channel, yeah, right, called right. I Never Thought I'd See This. Right. And or, without getting into all the details of what you just articulate in that right. video, that along with your book, A Church in Crisis, very clearly identify sources and people that you would say would even be contributing to yeah. a, a disintegration or a disunity or a, right. a departure from the things that would hold us in union. Right. So in your own heart and in your own kind of movement with the Lord as you've sensed where he's leading you, how has he led you to try to maintain the balance of striving for peace and unity while also being pretty direct yeah. and willing to name names, yeah. right, uh, in terms of what yeah. you see contributing to that yeah. lack of unity? Yeah. Well, there's a lot of people who have gone public yeah. uh, in a way that is confusing people. And it isn't like I'm revealing any secrets or anything like that, but it's more like there's people today that very boldly are uh, rejecting different aspects of the faith or are rejecting what the church actually accepts as legitimate and saying, I don't think it is legitimate. So I think there's people both on the left and the right who are publicly uh, rejecting the sources of our unity. So I felt like it's really important to uh, point that out so that we can regather around the sources of our unity, trying to do it in a respectful way, but trying to do it in an honest way. You know, some people say, well, it shouldn't be done. Don't pay attention to any of that. You can't not pay attention to it. It's getting, it's seeping into the mentality of average Catholics. And just the responses to that video I did last week, I don't think over 340, 350 responses and people saying, Wow, you know, thank God, you know, I thought I thought this something was off here, but I, I see it really is, and thank you for reaffirming the truth of the faith. And so, I think when you're able to name a deviation, you can get power over it and not be subject to it. Mm. Uh, so many people have told me, put, being able to put a name on this stuff is really, really helpful, and it really kind of allows me with greater freedom and greater commitment to kind of follow the actually authentic teaching of the church so it's a delicate matter you know I have to I, before I wrote the book I, you know I was praying asking the Holy Spirit to teach me to do it in the right way I submitted it to you and Peter and a whole bunch of other people at the seminary and you know trying to make sure I was doing it in a, in a right balanced way same with this recent video you know I, I sent it to a few people saying you know, this is pretty delicate stuff. I want to do it in the right spirit, in, in a way that reflects the spirit of Christ. You know, so I think. But Jesus Himself was very direct, yeah, about stuff that wasn't right. You know, you know, much more direct than I've been to this point. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, and and the Old Testament prophets too. You know, and Jesus even publicly said, "There's going to be." false teachers and false prophets they're going to come and they're going to try to disturb and lead people away from the faith Paul said when I leave wolves are going to get amongst the flock and he, he kind of called out people he said these people are making a shipwreck of the faith you know type yeah. of thing so, so there's been a battle for truth there's been a battle for the sources of the unity of the church ever since the time of Jesus and the apostles and so it's, it's still going on and I, I don't think everybody's called to do this, but I feel like the Lord has called me to to help identify some of the deceptions so people won't be subject to them and won't be a, a victim of them, but can really hold on to Christ and the truth of church. Do you feel, do you ever worry or do you, have you ever been maybe accused of cherry picking or only speaking about certain topics for, in a regular way? Like, for instance, like would somebody say, Ralph, you, you always seem to, to, issue a video whenever hell comes up or doesn't come up right yeah. or or when there's certain corruptions around sexual morality right. then, then that's when when that's when we hear you yeah. speak or is there a way that you've tried to navigate when to speak yeah. and when not to speak because yeah. not all issues are created equal right not all teachings are created right. equal either yeah. yet at the same time you have a pretty 
consistent track record over now decades mm-hmm. of having a pretty similar drumbeat to certain topics. Yeah. Um, does that concern you at all, ever that 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 people might think you kind of harp on one thing more than the other, or yeah, how how do you navigate that? Yeah. Well, what I try to do is identify those issues that are most central, most fundamental, most affect people's salvation, and address those. Yeah. And so uh, there, there are many important issues, but I feel like the Lord wants me to pick out the things that most affect people's salvation. And so right now, the spirit of universalism, everybody saved, obviously is going to affect people's salvation. You know. <laughs> right. So I don't talk about it all the time, but it comes up a lot because many of our fellow Catholics are really into a mentality that God's so merciful everyone will be saved and God is so merciful but not everybody will be saved unless they respond to his mercy so it's a pretty simple message you know like right. this is what scripture says this is what Jesus yeah, says it's not your idea it's not my idea <laughs> don't shoot me I'm just a messenger <laughs> yeah, you know yeah, right, right. this is right there in the catechism of the Catholic Church have you noticed this is in Vatican II you know so right. it's almost like there's a, a systematic ignoring of some of the most fundamental truths sexual morality uh, I don't want to address that but the culture is forcing us to. Hmm. The culture is kind of putting it right in our face and saying, if you don't go along with a rejection of the Ten Commandments concerning sexual morality, if you don't kind of kind of reject what the Catholic Church has taught for 2,000 years and all the Christian churches have taught for 2,000 years, you're haters. Right. That pressure is there in a daily way on people's lives, you know? And so those are things I feel like I need to address. I, I, mean, I also address, of course, holiness and evangelization and right. you know, other, other things, you know, you know, like I probably have done, I don't know, 100 videos, you know, just on YouTube, but I've written bunches of books on different topics. But yes, I always come back to the things that I think are the most fundamental that most affect people's salvation. So I think part of it is a personal call. Yeah. Like the Lord says, I want you to do this. Right. And part of it is a judgment about What's most useful to do right now? What would be most helpful to people? Yeah. I mean, just to make you uncomfortable, one of the things that you've been described as is a, a, a prophet of sorts. That you've, mm. People have I've mm. seen the the messages come in, and mm. it's one of the ways I think people are trying to compliment you. Mm. So, one of the things that seems to characterize a prophet is a certain message from the Lord mm-hmm. that you are compelled to share. Yeah, kind of. Regardless yeah. if you're Jeremiah and you get thrown into a well, right? You just right. kind of, I got to say this. It's it's right. burning in my, my yeah. heart and in my mouth. Yeah. So without asking you to like necessarily identify yourself as a prophet, but mm-hmm. there is a, a way that we participate in yeah. the prophetic ministry yeah. of Jesus as yeah. part of his, yeah. you know, as a disciple. What? How do you see yourself that way or not? Or how would you describe yeah. that experience of feeling like, yes, the Lord has given me a message and kind of like I, I need to share it yeah yeah well I do <laughs> yeah 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 um, and I don't like the title prophet because that has all kinds of connotations and prophets aren't infallible uh, there's different kinds of prophets you know yeah they have different commissions you know you know all that kind of stuff but a couple of years ago I felt like the Lord said you need to accept that there's a prophetic element to what I've called you to do. And what I understand by that is what the prophetic element is and what, what's common to those who participate in the prophetic element is calling people back to God. Hmm. You know, calling people to repent, return to the covenant. You know, that's what the Old Testament prophets did. Uh, the New Testament prophets sort of like pretty much made alive the word of the God. You know, hmm. saying, you know, you know, this is, God is here right now, you know, and, and you need to pay attention to his word. It happened, you know, usually after the Eucharist where where the risen Christ would inspire people to uh, to worship, to praise, to surrender, to holiness, uh, and, you know, other specific things too. So I don't like the title prophet, but I, I don't deny that this is a prophetic element in what the Lord has asked me to do. But there's supposed to be a lot of people participating in a prophetic element these days, you know. Mm-hmm. How does a prophet and how do you... Uh, d- uh, discern your whether it's working or d- are you even concerned about that in your prophetic ministry so you said you hear you you sense your role as a prophet is to call people back to God yeah well when you read the Old Testament prophets very often that's ignored yeah and yet somehow they were still being faithful and fruitful yeah. even as people ignored the message yeah so do you, in you in the prophetic ministry how do you 
evaluate whether or not you're doing what the Lord's asking you to do when that may or may not lead to yeah. a response that you're looking for. Yeah. Well, I feel like the Lord's made it easy for me. You know, I think he's called me to go to the green wood rather than the dry wood, hmm. to people who are alive in the faith to a certain degree and have a certain openness to the Lord, but maybe are confused or maybe are lukewarm or uh, maybe have never heard clearly the gospel but have a, you know, not a hostility towards it. So I feel like I've a mission in the Catholic Church, you know, yeah. you know, type of thing. And, um, and, and the Lord has opened pathways to basically help Catholics become stronger, which I think is really important. So I don't have a really that hard a mission in that regard, although, you know, I have been banned in certain dioceses over <laughs> yeah. the years yeah. and, you know, and, you know. Been that, counted worthy to, yeah, that to could, suffer at his name. Yeah, happen in the future, you know, things like that. But, uh, you know, some people have written bad things about me and have kind of published, you know, what I think are, you know, inaccurate descriptions of what I believe and what I do, but it's minor compared to, you know, being thrown into the cistern. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Fair enough. Good. Yeah. Um, within the current moment, just let's just say within the church, where there are many voices, lots of content, lots of opinions, mm-hmm. lots of understandings of different things that have been said, mm-hmm. lots of interpretations of documents, yeah. interviews, off the cuff remarks, yeah. lots of that, right? Yeah. Uh, there is a there's a sense, at least, and I think of Catholics of goodwill that we desire to remain faithful mm-hmm. to the church, mm-hmm. that we're not going anywhere, right? But I think there's also a sense within that that crowd of what does that actually mean? Yeah, what do we? What does it mean to remain faithful to the church? Right. So I wonder if you could actually like break that down, like when somebody says, "I want to remain faithful to the church." Yeah, wh- what is that? Yeah, I think there's a lot of people wondering about that today, Pete, so that's a, that's a good question to ask. Um, the Catholic Church has been established by Christ as his body, and it has a structure, it has an authority structure, it has a sacramental structure, it has a doctrinal code, uh, it has a way of life, and um, the fullness of the means of salvation are contained with it. And Every time I talk about problems in the church, I also try to make clear that I'm not going anywhere, and they shouldn't go anywhere either, because this is where the fullness of the means of salvation is. This is what Christ has established. Now, what becomes confusing for people is when people who are leaders in the church, or their parish priest, or their bishop, or cardinal, or pope, begin saying stuff that, from their study, from their good formation, knows is not true. Yeah. Or even seeing people who are leaders um, leading people away from fidelity to Christ or chastity, for example, or the urgency of evangelization or, you know, any, any one of a number of things or reverence for the Eucharist or whatever. Yeah, right. Uh, and so what do you do then? So part of the problem is that the last couple popes we've had, John Paul II and Benedict XVI, were really pretty solid doctrinally and, and pretty careful in what they said in interviews. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so people had a high degree of trust and admiration for them, you know, type of thing. And John Paul II can canonize as a saint. They recognize holiness in them, that type of thing. Uh, Benedict, one of the clearest, you know, best theologians that have ever held the papal office type of thing. Uh, and so with Pope Francis, quite honestly, it's, it's a different situation. He's He's not really a theologian, you know, as his primary thing. He said, you know, he's he's had to study theology along the way. And he's he has a different vision of being a pope. And uh, you know, when he when he began his pontificate he says, you know, go out there and make a mess. And I think he maybe feels like that's a good thing for him to do too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so we're seeing a bit of a mess. And part of the mess is uh, on the one hand, he says a lot of really good things that are really solid. I, I teach his first uh, apostolic exhortation, uh, Joy of the Gospel, in my class at the seminary. Uh, Bishop McClory, who's on our board of uh, you know directors for Renewal Ministries, just published a wonderful uh, pastoral letter where he quotes that document from Francis many times. You know, lots yeah. of really good quotes type yeah. of thing. 
And then on the other hand, he, he does things that seem like kind of undercuts, you know, some of the things he's previously said or some of his appointments seem kind of to lean in a direction of kind of de-emphasizing sexual morality and de-emphasizing doctrine. He'll even say things like that, you know, these people are, are into rigid document, you know, I want you to be pastoral and compassionate. Yeah. Sometimes you get a sense that pastoral and compassionate means not really calling people to repentance, you know. Right. And then you have strange things like uh, him reforming the John Paul II Institute on Marriage and the Family, you know, where it was established to further deepen the Catholic Catholic understanding of marriage and the family. And he's changed it now to bring sociology into it and culture into it. And he's appointed somebody to be in charge of it who has... Uh, canceled the courses of the two main key people there who were most knowledgeable about the teaching of John Paul II. He's brought in two theologians from northern Italy who are on record for saying, well, maybe homosexual activity might be okay, and maybe contraception might be okay, and a little ambiguity, a little confusion. And uh, and he himself, of course, is, is known for saying a lot of strange things himself about euthanasia and other things like that. So how do you interpret that? You know, what do you say? Is that is somebody asleep at the wheel in Rome letting stuff like that happen? Does Pope Francis know what's going on? It's hard for me to believe he doesn't know what's going on. And then the recent thing that just happened with Cardinal Hollerick, which we won't get into because you know, it's on the yeah, video. You can watch the video. Yeah, yeah that's the other thing. You know, how, how could somebody who says he doesn't believe in the church's teaching on homosexuality lead the synod that's going to influence the whole church and the whole direction of the future. How could he say something like that with Pope Francis knowing? I don't know. But here we have to distinguish between uh, imprudent sayings, you know, interviews on airplanes are not magisterial teaching. Uh, he's not declaring new doctrines. He may be unwisely uh, and maybe even incompetently advocating a pastoral compassionate approach that it really isn't pastoral and really isn't compassionate but he's not formally teaching error. He's, he's not a heretic. You know, I know there's a lot of stuff going on now on the internet with Catholic conservative commentators who are accusing him of being an anti-pope or being a heretic or teaching heresy, but he's not, he's not teaching heresy. To teach heresy, you have to formally know that you're teaching something that's a departure from the faith and persistently hold to it in an explicit way. To teach something that's magisterial teaching it requires a pretty high level of what there's, there's actually Vatican documents that guide us about how to understand the level of authority and the different documents that are being yeah, published. Yeah. So, what it says is that you know, you know the level of authority by how solemnly it's being taught, you know, the, the form of it. You know the level of magisterial authority by how often it's being spoken. And you know the level of magisterial authority by how many people are signing on to it type of thing. Hmm. And so, uh, you know, every now and then a pope will kind of throw something out in a document. Pope Francis even throws things out in documents. He says, I'm throwing this out for discussion. Yeah, right, right. But people don't notice that. So even within a particular document, for example, the highest level of, of a papal document short of an infallible uh, ex cathedra definition, which we haven't had for a long time, is in a cyclical. But even within an encyclical, there's different levels of authority, hmm. you know. And so, like, and and then it comes an apostolic exhortation. So most of the stuff that's going on are apostolic exhortations or something like executive orders, moto proprios. Yeah. Yeah. And the, there's just different levels of authority, and some are reversible. Uh, some could be the personal opinion of the pope, but he, as much as says that, he says, you know, let's let's kind of discuss this, or right. I want things to be decentralized. And what do you guys think over there in your country? You know, type well, of that's thing. the whole idea of a synod, on yeah. synodality. Right. Yeah. What do you all think about this? Yeah, right. that type of thing. So, so people are having to adjust to a different style of papacy, and they're going to have to learn how to distinguish different levels of authority, and they're going to have to recognize that. If Pope Francis or some other leading churchman says something that's off, it's not magisterial teaching. But that means that you have to have a firm grounding in what the truth is. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and you have to kind of give the benefit of the doubt to when somebody says something. Like in the video I did last week, I talked about something that Pope Francis seemed to be saying, everybody goes to heaven, even people who deny the faith and persecute Christians and renounce their baptism. But maybe he doesn't really mean that, you know, type of thing. And yeah. 
you know, maybe if you sat down and have a conversation with them, you say, no, I didn't mean that type of thing. You know, so you have to kind of give people the benefit of the doubt. You have to not jump to conclusions. You need to not have to kind of sure. kind of settle on a stray remark and think that that's something he formally holds as heresy or something. So for, for the normal Catholic, and maybe even for the non-believer or the mm-hmm. non-Catholic, yeah. everything you just said is not impossible to understand. Mm-hmm. Right, but there are a lot of big churchy words in there, you yeah. know, like encyclical yeah. and modo yeah, proprio, right. and <laughs> yeah. you used a lot of good fancy in-house inside baseball yeah. language, yeah. right? Which I think, by and large, those of us who've been catechized has some framework for what you're you're mm-hmm. talking about. So, one of two responses then would be probably, well, it seems like there are two one of two responses when people hear these things: mm-hmm. either they ignore it, yeah, and just say it doesn't matter because it isn't. Re- rising to the level of the magisterial teaching that you're describing so why bother even addressing it Mm -hmm. just leave it alone Mm -hmm. and then the other side is the the camp you just described a second ago that then are calling the pope a heretic yeah so how do you determine and and how should we determine what things we should just kind of go oh whatever he's a man or the uh, any any of these these men or any any theologian is 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 a person who's capable of error yeah and and all that yeah and how do you determine between that and, no, actually, this needs to be addressed, this needs to be called out, this needs to be identified, this needs to be rebuked, yeah. because it actually has the, the potential to do real damage. Yeah. Is there any way that you kind of navigate that, or is that just governed well, by the Spirit? Well, I say if, if it's just a stray remark here and there, you just say, hmm, you know, whatever, you know, maybe he had a who's confused that day, or maybe it wasn't translated accurately, or something like that. Mm-hmm. But if... He's appointing people who are saying similar type of things that are leaning in a certain direction. Then you kind of say, gee, um, you know, it seems like without explicitly teaching against Catholic teaching, there's a sympathy for a a watered-down understanding of it. Yeah. And then I would say, well, gee, I think we need to be clearer with people that we can't water down Catholic teaching. I think we have to be clear to people that Catholic teaching that's established in the tradition of the church and the catechism of the Catholic Church really can't be, be changed. You can't change the Ten Commandments. No pope can change the Ten Commandments. Yeah. No no pope can change the creed. No pope can claim, can change, you know, how the Catholic Church has approached these issues for 2,000 years, can overturn sacred tradition. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's a matter of judgment. It's also a matter of personal responsibility and personal call. Most, most ordinary Catholics aren't called to have to deal with these issues yeah. by themselves. And that's why we're trying to give some guidance, some you know, help people who are more in a position to help people sort things out and need to do it. But it's, it's unrealistic to expect the average person to, to sort it all out. That's why we're doing what we're doing. Right. One of the things that recently came up, I got a text from somebody I love very much, where he was quite frustrated by the recent statement from the Vatican regarding the the, the baptisms. And for oh, those yeah, who yeah, aren't yeah. familiar with yes. what happened was basically there was there have been some renegade deacons and priests who have changed. And they the, were they weren't trying to be renegades, were they? They thought well, they were doing apparently not. You yeah, know, for, they thought they were doing a good deed. But that also hold that thought because I have a question about at what point does either incompetence or uh, ignorance become nefarious. Yeah. But we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Yeah. But the the whole idea being that there's, however, maybe hundreds, if not thousands of baptisms mm-hmm. that the Vatican has now ruled were not just mm-hmm. poorly done, mm-hmm. were actually illicit, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So this idea being that that actually didn't happen, a baptism didn't really take place. Yeah, they didn't use the proper form. Right. Rather than saying, I baptize you, they said, we baptize, baptize you. you. Talk about the Christian community. Yeah, right. And that was sufficiently of a you know, deterrent from the form that the Vatican has ruled. Yeah, said that these were invalid baptisms. These were invalid baptisms. <laughs> yes. So what, the reason that the, the brother who texted me, you know, the, yeah. the friend who texted me, he was kind of saying the church seemingly here is making a mountain out of a molehill. Yeah. Literally like one word. Yeah. When then on this, on, and then the juxtaposition he was making was between that where a mountain out of a molehill and then you have priests who've, abuse children yeah and it doesn't seem like we've reacted nearly as strongly to that <laughs> yes. now obviously that's an oversimplification of yeah. some of the response the church has had yeah. to the abuse the yeah. very real and significant response yeah. at the same time for especially a lot of non-catholics 
they could be like, what's up with your church? Mm-hmm. You, you have an issue with one word, but you don't have any issue, it seems like, with, <laughs> yeah. with guys who are abusing children. I mean, like, so I, I tried to do the best I could to describe how it doesn't have to be an either-or situation. We should be really serious about both yeah. because of the nature of both. Yeah. But how would, how would you respond to that? Well, fortunately, somebody asked this exact same question to Dr. Mary Healy and myself. Oh, okay. Yes. And Dr. Mary Healy, in her generosity, immediately responded in, a, I thought, a wonderful way, which I didn't have to. She yeah. did better than I could have done. We actually should have her do a YouTube video on this little okay, issue. Okay, good. Yes, really please. But what she basically said is we need to uh, respect the form that the church has established for the sacraments. When I say I baptize you, it's not the priest baptizing, it's Jesus baptizing you. So the I is important. It's just been part of our tradition. And the Catholic Church has been given authority by Christ to decide how these things should work. You know, whatever right. you bind on earth, I'll bound you in heaven. Whatever you bound, bound you know, whatever you loose, I'll loose. And this is all from Jesus. Yeah, it's I mean, all this from is all Jesus. You know, so him. the Church yeah. has been given authority over these things. You know, and we know that baptism is necessary for salvation. You know, and, and that will require another conversation. But uh, so it's a serious thing. But Mary points out that what the church has responded has left out half the story mm. and that um, it does come across as nitpicking and legalistic and almost pharisaical yeah, right I mean like yeah, a, yeah. The one iota type thing right? yeah it comes across like that and what she needed to what, what the church needs to add to it honestly I just talked to her last night about this and we don't know of anybody who's actually added what needed to be added there's a traditional theological understanding called baptism of desire. Yes. You know, and that when you desire something, even though the exact form isn't there or the opportunity to do it right isn't there, the Lord can grant the grace for it. Right. So Mary says the church should say that uh, don't freak out if you don't know whether the proper form of baptism was used in your case. The intention was there for baptism. Yeah. And it's very reasonable to believe that the Lord gave you those graces and everything else that's happened in your life, including your marriages and so on. So exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or your if, priesthood. <laughs> yeah, right, or your priesthood type of thing. You know, if you have some reason to believe that the form wasn't used correctly, g- go ahead and get conditionally re baptized if you're not sure, or if you're sure mm-hmm. the wrong form was used, get baptized, you know, mm-hmm. formally, but sacramentally. So 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 this is this is kind of the point though. Like yeah. why doesn't that second half of the story and and then is it simply just poor public relations like do we just have a really terrible communications department in the Vatican that can't seem to notice that when you just seem to go really intense on something like this and then are lukewarm or kind of uh, I mean like a lot of the statements regarding some of the priest scandals read like a corporate document yeah you know and it's like here's a moment when you would think the most the most pastoral heart should come out and it's non-existent at all and then on the other side you have this i I don't know it's just it it, how what's your reading of that communication strategy yeah well being the one true church doesn't guarantee that all its members are are wise or inspired when it comes to addressing particular situations unfortunately and um I think there's been so many teaching moments that we haven't taken good advantage of Yeah. where it's just not enough to say what we said about the situation, but we need to do a little teaching to help people understand right. and use it to evangelize. Every single one of these situations can be used as an opportunity to reveal the treasure of the church, Jesus right. Christ, and uh, help people come closer to him. But we're not taking advantage of it. Partly is because there is certain a certain legalistic spirit you know, canon law is really a big thing in the Catholic Church, and if the bishop's going to send somebody away to do higher studies, canon law is almost the first priority type of thing. Right, and, right. So, and canon law is important, but one of the first things that it says in canon law is that it, this is all about the salvation of souls, you know. Hmm. So sometimes we, we lose the forest for the trees sometimes. Also, sometimes, quite honestly, uh, the bishop farms out these things to public relations departments, and public relations departments are saying, how can we put this to bed? How can we close yeah. this down? How can we settle it? And I've actually had some situations happen where uh, I've gone to a bishop and said, you know, this was a teaching moment, and you, you farmed it out to your public relations department, and what you did is throw this priest under the bus, you know? Yeah, you, you, right. ca- you caved into pressure from the world, 
and, and the bishop basically admitted that that happened. Yeah. You know, and so, yeah, this human weakness, mm -hmm. there's this lack of creativity sometimes, this lack of clergy sex abuse scandal. A lot of times they say, you know, these, these people aren't fathers. They, they, they don't have children. They don't know how horrible this is, you know, yeah, which is hard to believe. I mean, that's, that's what, that doesn't make any sense to yeah, me. I mean, I don't, yeah. know, I don't think you have to have a, a child to see how her, heinous something like this is, you know, like, yeah, and just it, almost like a natural. You know? Yeah, absolutely. But when you're part of a celibate club whose culture is to protect each other, and that's really, really strong element of the culture. Uh, sometimes that can kind of dull what sure. could be a natural instinct. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, well, that's a that's a whole other topic in the, in the sense of, and that's one of the things actually. Francis has been willing to yes. call out, yes. right? Is this right. clericalism in this right. kind of echo chamber of, yeah. of of protection for each other right. that, that he right. has identified as a problem? Right, right, and uh, sometimes. He does it with a hammer rather than a scalpel, but uh, sometimes priests get the feeling that he doesn't like priests. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, type of thing. Sometimes yeah. people working in the Vatican are saying, why do I bother, mm -hmm. you know, to leave my nice home diocese in the United States and, you know, get abused every year in the, in the Christmas address, you know, type of thing. Yeah. Does it do the, the common layperson any good? Is it any good for our soul? To, to go down the road that I mentioned a second ago where, so I'll, I'll put it this way. I've been wrestling with quite a bit of at what point does what seems like incompetence yeah. or ignorance yeah. on the part of clergy or other, mm -hmm. or other leaders mm -hmm. is so consistent and so regular and so kind of established that it's actually not incompetence or ignorance. It's some sort of nefarious intent to... To either do evil, yeah. God forbid, or change the very nature of the church. Like, yeah. does it does it actually do us any good to go down that that thought pattern? Because what I'm not sure what that would lead to. Yeah. Or is it better to just kind of say, this is all in the hands of divine providence. Yeah. The Lord's the ultimate judge. Yeah. I can only take care of what I can take care of. You know. Yeah. I, I say it's very likely that there's a network of people working to change what the church teaches, but. We can't make that judgment. You know, we'd be foolish not to say, you know, things are pointing in that direction. It could very well be the case. Right. But only God knows for sure what's what's going on, you know. Yeah. And he does know what's going on. He's got a plan to bring good out of it. When it, when it raises to the surface of uh, public confusion or public kind of deception, it should be addressed by competent people. I, I want to say one other thing about the prophetic thing that we were talking about a while yeah. ago. Uh it's really important that people who feel like they have some prophetic aspect to what God's asking them to do to be subject to the pastors. Hmm. It's really important that prophets not get into this mentality of, you know, God told me and people better kind of line up onto this type of thing, but it needs to be submitted hmm. to the judgment of pastors, you know, type of thing. So uh, I make a point of submitting what I'm doing to both my bishop in Lansing, my archbishop in Detroit where I teach. I sent them a copy of the video I just did. I sent them a copy of my book before it was published. Uh, so I'm trying to, uh, but but a lot of times they don't have the time to really deal with sure. stuff even though it's making an impact. So I try to share it with people I trust, their judgment, who are balanced, who are knowledgeable, like fellow seminary professors, people like you yeah. and Peter. Boards and of directors. And all yeah, that. board yeah. of directors and all that kind of stuff. I just sent the video to the board of directors asking for their input, you know, type of thing. So I think it's really important that people who feel like they're called to do or say something that they submit it to yeah. responsible people and have that attitude of submissiveness. That's a really good distinction, too, because it, it's not probably helpful to just have a bunch of people running around saying, the Lord said, speaking, you know, authoritatively yeah. in this way yeah. without a certain, well, without significant discernment yeah. and oversight. Right. And that's part of the problem with the prophetic ministry, you know. Um, it's It needs pastoring, and it's, it's tricky. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, we have so much more we can talk about, and we will in mm -hmm. future conversations. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to end with, and I think I want to do this every time we talk, because... Um, one of the things that has characterized your ministry and 
characterized renewal ministries moving forward is just trying to ground everything in scripture yeah right yeah like we we love reading the saints we yeah. love reading the popes we love all that but at the end of the day it's all of this is born out of what does the word of god reveal to us right yeah and so um i'm going to read you a scripture and then i just want you to to share what you think of it <clears throat> okay therefore do not be anxious saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear for the gentiles seek all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them all but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things shall be yours as well yeah well pete you know that that's a, a foundational scripture passage for me really it's at the very foundation of my life my marriage uh that you can find that in luke 12 or matthew 6 and jesus is telling us come on put your main focus on growing in holiness seeking first the kingdom of god uh and his holiness and then everything else you need for whatever you're supposed to do whatever god created you for whatever else you need he's going to give it to you because your father knows you need these things even to the basic necessities of life you know this isn't a promise of getting a lexus this isn't well, the prosperity. Okay. Yeah, yeah this isn't the prosperity gospel but we don't need prosperity if we don't need prosperity right you know we don't need a lexus we don't really need a lexus what we need is the basic things we need to carry out the mission that the lord has given us to accomplish on earth and so what a beautiful promises from the lips of jesus yeah it's true it's real and 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 we got we got to connect it with philippians chapter 4 where paul says don't be anxious about anything not just food and drink and clothing but don't be anxious about anything but entrust it all to the hands of the Lord, and then the peace of Christ will come and dwell in your heart. So this is applicable to all the things we've been talking about, too. Yeah. Let's let's turn it all over to the Lord, you know. Any any anxiety we have concerning what's happening in the church or what's happening in our personal lives, you know, let's just, let's just turn it over to the Lord and trust Him to bring good out of it, trust Him to show us what we need to know about it, and trust Him to show us what we need to do about it if we need to do anything. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, if you like this, uh, we'll be doing these as regularly as the Lord inspires us to do so. And uh, you can get more of this type of content and inspiration from Ralph and Peter Herbeck and others at the Renewal Ministries YouTube channel. And uh, we have several different podcasts you can tune into as well. You can just search Renewal Ministries in any of your podcast locations and you'll find it. So Ralph, this was fun. Yeah. We'll do it again. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, God bless you all.